Hello, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada. I'm shooting from the Lugnuts facility. And uh, what we have behind me here is uh, 1969 Alfa Romeo GTV 1750. So this is a preview uh, of this car, that, uh, which is for sale right now in, in Calgary, Canada. Uh, so we'll do a narrated video and uh, we'll start with uh, a very brief discussion of, this, uh, of, the, of the Alpha 105 series, which this is. Um, and then we'll do a walk around of the, uh, all the paint, glass, and rubber, and so forth. Uh, we'll have a look at the interior, um, seats, carpet, headliner, etc. Uh, we'll poke around the engine bay, and then we'll lift the car on the hoist, and we'll go through the undercarriage of the car as well and then we'll conclude with, um, with a driving video. So I try to make these videos as thorough as possible. Um, they take, you know, usually around 40 minutes by the time I've, I've gone through everything uh, with a car. Um, they're broken into sections, so there's a table of contents. So if you just wanted to skip through to the paint meter or the driving video or the cold start portion or whatever, look at the, at the uh, table of contents and then you can skip forward in the video. Uh, and the, the first section, we'll talk about uh, the GTV uh, in general. With talking about Alfa Romeo, I realize that I think I'm talking to the Alfisti, who probably know everything about this car. Um, so I'll, um, uh, and, and there's much better sources of information than me. But just to frame it, um, this is an example of the famous GT, GTV uh, series of Alfa Romeo coupes um, that were spun off from the sedan version, um, made I think from 1963 all the way to 1977. Uh, the, it encompasses the GT Junior, which was a less powerful, smaller displacement series of cars, and the larger engine cars of the 1750 and two liter cars. There was a, an aluminum bodied twin plug GTA racing version of it. There was a convertible version of it. So this is, um, this is a North American 1969 GTV. The GTV, the V in, 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 G, in GTV is veloce, which is, which is fast, which differenti differentiates it from the smaller displacement cars. Okay. So there were several manufacturers in the early 70s that experimented with mechanical fuel injection systems. Uh, so we had, we had the, uh, the mechanical system in the early 911s, and the Italians have the Spica mechanical fuel injection system, which they put in their North American cars, but not the European cars. Um, and we also had examples from you know, the Triumph uh, TR250, TR5, I guess, and the Maserati Mistral and some other cars. Okay, so in the early 70s, uh, the mechanical fuel injection systems were maybe a better solution for the emissions regulations in North America at the time. This car has been converted back to Weber's. Um, the mechanical fuel injection systems, well, actually, they came out in the, the 300 SL in the 50s. Um, when they're set up properly, and maintained properly, they work wonderfully, and when they're not, they don't, <laughs> and, and there's not too many people that can fix them. Um, I, I was talking to somebody on the 300 SL, and he said he had 40, or he, he actually no, he did he did Porsche mechanical fuel injection pumps, and he said he had 40 on the bench, waiting to get through them all. So it's not easy to service these alphas when they have the mechanical fuel injection in them. And unless you're right beside somebody in San Francisco or something like that, it can be tough. So this one has been converted into Weber's. Um, it was given a comprehensive re restoration, you know, probably starting in the last 10 years, which was down to the body shell. Um, it's always been this color, uh, which is uh, the uh, yellow okra color, which is a Looks fantastic, a, a fantastic um, period color. I know with Porsche they have several yellow hues in this, in this. I think Bahama yellow maybe maybe closest. 
but anyway, it's a, great, it's a great period color that came out in the 70s. This is a 69. So there were continued light changes, bumper changes, um, changes to the interior instrumentation and so on. The 69, uh, you know, many Alfistis consider the 69 the best year for the GTV. And uh, I believe it's the only year with these seats. And uh, maybe uh, we'll, we'll get a shot of those later, but they have the, uh, the uh, holes in the side rest. And anyway, they're, they're, they're very sporty, very cool looking, and kind of unique to this year, Alfa Romeo. And um, others prefer the 1750 engine to the two liter engine as it uh, is a little bit revier. Okay, so we've got, in short, we've got a fully restored Alfa GTV that isn't rusted with a clean undercarriage that's had all the mechanical components completely rebuilt, that runs beautifully, works beautifully, gearbox is excellent, brakes, etc. cetera, um, in a great period color that's the original color to this chassis, uh, which is the yellow okra. Um, and uh, uh, it has a uh, you know, fully restored interior and so on. So uh, in addition to that, um, it's already been for sale on BAT twice, so it's been vetted by, you know, all the, you know, alpha enthusiasts at the time. So if you're interested in it, you can go read everybody's comments, and that's on two separate occasions it was thrown out there to the uh, alpha community for them to go through and comment on the car. And so there's a lot of, a lot of, and, and in those auctions, they're like 25,000 views which is a lot for a bad auction. I mean, most of them are under 10. So there's been an awful lot of people, alpha enthusiasts, who've looked at the car and weighed in with their opinions of it. Okay, so that, that's all, that, that sort of wraps up what, what these cars are and this particular example. And now we can go to the exterior walk around and the paint meter. And uh, we'll just go through it panel by panel and I'll pick out the you know, imperfections on the car, which there are not very many of. Uh, okay, so let's just go through all the wrecks of the exterior. First, if we can put the camera here and look down the flanks, uh, we'll see that there's no scratches and there's no door dings and the Quality of the paint is excellent. There's no orange peel in it. Uh, we don't see any scratches, and we don't see any waviness of the panels, okay? So um, we also see that the character line uh, matches the doors and goes right through to the end. Um, so, you know, the, the, we don't see any prep marks in the paint, um, and, uh, at least not, not any material ones that are visible or, or obvious. And the overall paint looks excellent, okay? And let's, we'll do it on this side too. And we'll look down the flank and I don't see any scratches or uh, imperfections or door dings or waviness in the panel. And we see a nice, again, the character line continues right through the door uh, and those and those lines uh, are sharp okay so uh, again same thing with the hood and the deck lid um, the uh, the paint is uh, really glass smooth I mean if you look really closely you know you can see the odd you know the odd little imperfection. I mean, it's really tough to do on camera. Um, but uh, overall, I think anybody looking at the paint quality on this car would, would come away thinking it's, it's an excellent paint job. There's no runs, there's, um, and, and you can tell somebody really has taken a lot of care to, um, to you know, make the panels perfectly smooth without any waviness in them. Okay. So going through some of the trim, you know, the chrome is 
excellent. We have H4 uh, halogens on it. Uh, we've got these plastic grill pieces, which look to be, oh, they're metal, sorry, they're not plastic. Uh, they're excellent. We've got a dent in this one piece of uh, trim here. The bumpers look excellent. They're not scratched up. The chrome isn't pitting. The, uh, the light lenses uh, look new. They're not uh, faded from the sun. Uh, the center grill, the badge is bright, and um, uh, the, uh, the grill is, uh, the chrome shows nice. Uh, again, the light lenses are clear, and the bezels are free of pitting, and so on, as is the bumper. So all these parts look to be exceptionally well preserved or, or re-chromed and or new. Uh, for the windshield, uh, we don't, well, we see there's a little pit there. And, uh, you know, the surround for the windscreen is excellent. A uh, little bit of evidence of uh, some scratching on it. It's probably original piece. And we have a supple uh, windscreen seal. So that's obviously been redone. Wiper arms and so forth look to have all the correct hardware. They're not, then they're the chrome arms. I mean, new ones are black, so somebody took the time to get the correct wiper arms on the car. Uh, if we go over here, we can see the Alfa Romeo mirror, and we have the Alfa Insignia there. And again, the chrome is unpitted, um, and it's not scratched up, okay? So the, uh, the trim for the windows uh, is excellent and all the rubber is soft, so it looks like all this has been replaced for the front and the rear window. Uh, door handle and so on also looks excellent. Uh, the Quadrifoglio, Quadrifoglio badge uh, is bright, looks new. Okay, going around uh, the rear uh, window, uh, the, again, the seal is new. This looks to be an original chrome surround. It has some slight, uh, some slight scratching, but overall is, uh, is still excellent. The rear trunk lid, we've got uh, the bright Alfa Romeo badging. We do have a crack in the paint, probably from somebody closing the lid too hard, so we'll disclose that. Um, but uh, again, you barely notice that. Uh, for the rear lights, again, the rubber is, looks new. Chrome surrounds are excellent. And the lenses are uncracked. And the rear bumper uh, looks excellent, okay? Very, very minor scratching, otherwise excellent. Um, this uh, tailpiece here uh, has got a dent in it. Um, so that, uh, that, that could be renewed, okay? Uh, around this side, Again, uh, quadrifoglio badge looks good, and the trim and weather stripping, door handles, badging, again, all looks new. Um, we've got, uh, the wheels are all refinished. Um, I think there's an invoice from Alphaholics for these, for these, for these wheels. Um, so I think, I think they're actually new wheels, not refinished, and we have new tires on them. So, uh, so cosmetically on the exterior, uh, it all looks fresh, it all looks recently restored. There's no obvious flaws from any of the rubber, glass, or trim pieces. All the trim pieces look to be correct. Um, uh, you know, correct finishes and so on. So. There's a, it all looks properly done cosmetically on the exterior of the car. So I think any time you're looking at any 60s or 70s Italian car, Ferrari, Alfa, doesn't matter, um, you really need to look at rust. It's obviously it's the most important thing. And so with a paint meter here, we can check the paint depth and if there's any excess filler, it, it's gonna show up on the, on the paint depth meter. Now, this reads in micrometers, so it's one thousandth of a millimeter. So if I get a reading of a thousand, it's 
one millimeter of um, uh, 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 filler, primer, and paint. So on a new car, you know, painted by, you know, from fresh metal on, a, you know, in a paint booth with a modern manufacturing, you might get a paint depth of 200 micrometers or one fifth of a millimeter. If you're repainting a car, again, like on a, on a new car, for instance, um, and you're repainting a fender, um, you might get a reading of three or four hundred micrometers. But generally for older cars, uh, we're using high block primers to smooth, you know, smooth out uh, any of the ripples or whatever else is in there. You know, you might expect readings around, you know, 600 to 1,000 micrometers. Um, if you get into two and three thousands, well then now there's more filler than just is necessary to, you know, block sand the car for a perfectly, you know, smooth paint job. You know, now you're getting into filler, which has been done instead of metal work, which, you know, which would have been more difficult. So let's, let's just go see what this car is, and I'll put the uh, paint meter on all the panels, and we can just see what's there. So start with the hood, and we get 994, so a millimeter there, uh, 400 micrometers, uh, 340, 1100, 1000, 230, 295, uh, 1800. And when you get a big number, you need to just, you know, do a few different samples here because it's easy to kind of get a rogue number. Okay, so what we see on the hood is, you know, generally around a millimeter or a little bit less, which is consistent with an older car that's had a good body job. Fenders, uh, you know, in the twos and threes, And again, the difference between, you know, 200 and 300 is we're talking one tenth of a millimeter. So, you know, some of those differences are even explained by polishing, okay? All right, let's continue the door. And again, we're in the threes. And we've got some filler around the top of this door. Not too bad. A little bit more than a millimeter. So there's probably a dent there somewhere where there's more filler than on the rest of it. So there's a small area here that would have had a dent with up to, you know, 1600 micrometers. And let's see the doors. Now, the rust, the areas where it's going to rust, of course, are in the lower parts of the body, and so we will um, take particular pay attention to that because they're going to rust in the lower fenders, um, which on most cars would normally have been cut out and replaced. So, well, this one we've got two mils, one mil, but nothing scary. And let's check this still. Um, a note about this line here, and maybe just back up a bit. Yeah. So if you have a really poor job and your sills are filled with rust and you just slap Bondo in and, uh, and, uh, and paint it, you, you lose this line here um, often. So you often see that in a bunch of poorly restored cars where this is all just filled in. So when you've still got the, nor the normal gap, I mean, that tells you that the sills are, are intact. And, you know, these are, and so the paint meter readings here are a lot lower. Uh, you know, they're in the ones. And so, um, you know, this would, uh, the conclusion I'd come to here is that, is that these sills are new, okay? So that's what, that's what this will tell you. Uh, so overall, it's a decent job. Um, 
we, uh, we don't have any uh, paint wear where the door and the body or the sill has come together. We have uh, decent gaps, not perfect, but decent. Um, and uh, most importantly, we have all new metal and uh, we don't have a, you know, evidence of, you know, large amounts of filler, which is the main thing. So we'll continue with the rear quarter and the paint meter. And again, we're in the threes. Fives, millimeter, you know, sixes, so all under a millimeter. A bit more in the rear, 1100s. Okay, nothing scary. This area here is really vulnerable, jacking points and so on. And again, there's nothing scary in it. And then the other area that we'll look closely at is, of course, right behind the rear wheel. And this is very susceptible. Of course, all the mud gets caked in there and it rusts. So in this case, um, you know, it's all threes and fours or one six. So, you know, probably, you know, these pieces would have been replaced. Um, let's go on the trunk lid. And the trunk lid isn't too susceptible to anything, so you're not really expecting any surprises, and we don't get any. The rear panel, again, place in the car that normally would be the last to rust, and we're not getting any surprises there. The rear valence, well, this is very susceptible. And uh, so we're getting It's got a, it's a, it's a ribbed um, panel, so I think there's some filler, not filler, but paint in between the ribs, but uh, this is not a rusted piece, okay, so probably it was new uh, when the body restoration was done, and let's continue to this fender, and four, three, so, and that's just a repaint over the whole top of this. And again, we take special care to examine this area. And that's eights and nines, sevens, 1 1.2, 1 1.8. Okay, so I think there's a little bit of filler in this area here. Okay, just on the corner, but not too bad, okay. Um, rear fender arch, sixes and sevens, threes. One mil of paint. Or less, but there are some areas in this panel that are a little bit thicker. And again, in the center, but not, but not around the periphery, okay? So there's something happened in this area as well. And maybe that's just building the curve for the, um, for the body work, not sure. Um, but again, the outer bits of it are all, uh, there's not a lot of material there, but in the center there is more. Okay, let's go to the door. Again, one mil.
Okay, and it looks like we've got some filler a little bit thicker in the bottom edge of the door. Depending where on the door. Okay, but around a millimeter in the door. And a place in the center where there's some filler. Okay, I will also let you know, it looks like, you know, when the, car, when the door is shut, uh, it looks like there's some, there was some flex in the panel and we have a little hairline crack there that's probably caused by somebody putting too much force on the handle. It, it's really not noticeable, but it is, it is there and uh, we'll disclose that. Okay, let's check the lower sills. We're in the twos. And again, this tells me, uh, this tells me that uh, this is new metal here. Okay. And then a lower part of this fender. Overall, uh, we have, most importantly, an unrusty car. No evidence of any corrosion anywhere in the body shell. Uh, no, no surface rust that's been painted over. Uh, we have evidence of new metal in some of the lower extremities. For the rest of the body shell, there's a couple places where there were dents. Um, that have some filler in them, but that does not attract from the overall appearance of the car and the quality of the actual paintwork, uh, which is excellent. And, uh, you know, when you try to get an old car and you want a perfectly glass smooth panel, you generally have to put in quite a bit of filler and primer to, and then block sand it to get that kind of perfect paint finish you're looking for. And so with that, you get quite a bit of variation relatively in the depth of the paint. And that's why we see, you know, some uh, paint depths of 300 and others of 1800. But the end product of that is that when you look at the car and you look down the sides of it, um, you get, uh, you, you know, you have perfectly glass smooth panels. Okay. So This obviously has, you know, a brand new interior, um, and it looks it looks fresh. It looks it looks like it has very little, uh, if any, wear at all. So, uh, and that goes for just about everything in it. But um, uh, we'll go in and look at the sills, and they're not scratched up. We've got new uh, weather stripping throughout, framing the window and the door. I think uh, I've got a little bit of a tear in this weather, in this bit of the weather stripping there for some reason. Um, we've got, and it looks like all the weather stripping is in all the right places and everything fits well. Uh, looks like we have the correct, uh, you know, fastener and cup washer for the interior panels. And these pieces are all correctly fastened. It all looks correct and new. Um, importantly, this car has the uh, seats with the, uh, the vents in the back. So these are quite, um, quite sporty and uh, I believe unique to the 1969 and, uh, GTV and sought after by, by collectors. And, uh, you know, everything looks fresh here um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the vinyl for the seats, the carpets, 
um, the uh, center wood uh, veneer and the veneer on the, uh, on the dash. The dash top is um, uncracked and it is not a dash like a plastic dash cover stuck over a, a cracked dash. So the dash is a nice shape. Center console is a nice shape. The wheel is a nice shape. All the instruments are clear. Um, really, the interior, I don't think, can be faulted. Um, let's take a look at the floors. And uh, looks like we have the, um, the Dynamat, which has, been, um, uh, which has been glued down over the floors. And that's, that's a nice touch. This stuff isn't cheap. It's, you know, it's a, I think I paid about $1,000 to have that done on uh, the last one I did. Okay. Um, we can uh, go around to the passenger seat, passenger side. Okay, and same thing over here. Um, the door cards look excellent. They're not loose. Um, we have the correct fasteners on it. All these parts look uh, either exceptionally well preserved or new. Um, we've got the back of the car again, um, which I, I doubt anybody's ever ever sat in. Um, the uh, headliner, if you want to get a shot of that, uh, doesn't show any discoloration or leaks from water ingress. It's not brown, um, like that's what happens when your seals dry out and water leaks in the car. So really we've got an interior, I would say, that's impossible to reasonably fault. Um, all the switch gear is present and correct, and it all looks it all it, it all looks good, straight and uh, well fitted. Okay, so I don't think there's any issues here in the interior. Looks like like the way a restored car uh, should look. Uh, the trunk area. Let's go. Not sure what this piece is. But it comes with a car. Um, we've got our tools in the proper bag. The jack and tools are there. Um, and what else? Lifting up cover, we see the uh, spare and the, uh, and the finished and painted floor. Which all looks good, and what's over here? And there is the gas tank, and most importantly, no evidence of uh, rust, which comes through the floor on these. Okay, so that is the fuel filler area. Okay, so this was a North American market car, and to pass emissions. It would have normally had the Spica uh, mechanical fuel injection system. This has been replaced with the two side draft Webers. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a choke. It doesn't appear to need them. Um, this is a, um, a Series 1 GTV made, I think, from 67 to 69. For 70, there was a Series 2 GTV 750. One of the thing, and they, they were basically mechanical changes. One of the changes for the Series 2 was the um, twin boosters for the brake system and the, uh, and the, and the dual brake system because the laws had changed requiring uh, a backup system in case one brake system failed, okay? so. So uh, instead of doing a master cylinder, like a twin master cylinder, they did tw two individual master cylinders with two brake boosters. So this must have been retrofitted. I don't believe the 69 cars would have had, I could be wrong on this, but I don't believe the 69 cars would have had the two brake boosters, okay? Um, so that is a, you know, that's a worthwhile safety improvement. Okay, so we've got this 1969 Alpha GTV up in the air. Uh, we've taken the wheels off, um, and these are new 
new manufacturer, uh, I think GTA replica wheels, seven by 14. And we are just, uh, just taking the, um, the brake dust off the back of them. And we'll get you some photographs of what, uh, what they look like when they're cleaned up. But uh, uh, it says GTA on them and then seven by 14. And they wear 185, 65, uh, 14 Uniroyal Tiger Paw tires, which are new. Okay. Uh, up in the air, I mean, we can see that, uh, you know, this Alpha is, lots of attention has been given to it. Uh, basically a restored car. Um, so this is, let's have a look at the underside. And, you know, with any 60s or 70s Italian car, the, the, the body shell is going to be um, by far the most uh, important component, uh, the most expensive and most difficult to fix and so on. And these cars were known uh known to rust and uh so you know the whole the whole foundation of the car is the is the uh is the monocoque and so let's let's look underneath and we'll just kind of go through all of it and just to make sure everybody is uh knows exactly what they're buying okay so let's let's examine the underneath of this car there there was a reference it's been on bring a trailer a couple of times and there was some reference to some rust repair. Um, now we can see the original undercoating that's on this car that was painted over. So we'll have a pretty good idea of, you know, what was done to it. Um, it looks to me like there was a little bit of repair um, uh, on, the, on the behind the passenger side front wheel because um, that's just a lot smoother than the rest of the material. So it looks like there, there may have been a repair at that area. The jacking points look solid and, and original with no, uh, with no soft metal um, that, that, I can, that I can tell. Um, there looks to be you know, evidence of some rust repair in the lower sills, I would say lower doors and lower sills, but I don't see that carrying on to the floor pans, which have looked to have the original, um, you know, weather stripping on them or the jacking points, which look to me to be original. So I, I would suggest that, you know, this car at some point had some rust repair to, uh, to this area here and maybe a little bit to the bottom of the door and the rear fender. Um, again, all the areas in the, in the inner arches that look original to me, um, you know, there may have been some repair, like I said, in this area here. We also have a paint meter, so we'll check that. Um, these fender arches look original to me. The outside, you know, this, this trailing edge of the, the body, this is very susceptible to rust. And uh, there's no soft metal or, or in any indication of any rust at all in this whole area, okay? And then in the, uh, in the driver's side rear arch, again, we see the original undercoating and we see the solid metal all around and the jacking point um, look, looking original and uh, certainly, certainly solid, okay? So the rear floor pans, Again, it's a little, you know, the, the paint's a little bit uh, um, inconsistent because it was the overspray, or it was, it was painted over the undercoating. Um, but, you know, all this is, uh, is solid. And uh, the sills, you know, which are critical to the, the door shuts and so on, you know, all of that, uh, you know, looks like, um, you know, completely unrusted, okay? So... These areas here, you know, these frame rails uh, are solid. I mean, there's the odd place where it looks like it was jacked up in, in the wrong place. But again, we've got the paint over the original undercoating. The odd little, an odd little, uh, again, dent from people jacking the car up, which is, which is extremely common. And, uh, you know, the floor pans look good. This is just undercoating um, and uh, but solid you know solid metal so there's there's no soft metal or holes in you know any of these areas of the car and the outer perimeter 
you know, that's where the, that's where the, you know, the dirt and moisture uh, collect. And this is what rusts first and these cross members. So all this is in good shape. And, um, you know, it appears to be a completely, you know, rust free body shell. Okay, so now we'll do a uh, cold start and driving video of the uh, 69 Alfa Romeo. So uh, it's, uh, it's about, it's pretty cold out. It's about, uh, I'd say about five or six degrees Celsius. Uh, we pushed the car outside um, and it's been outside for about an hour now and we didn't start it, okay? So uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll get Aiden here to show you what comes out of the tailpipe when we fire the car up, uh, and then we can look at the pressure, the oil pressure, and so on from the gauges inside the car, and then we'll listen to the we'll listen to the car idle for a while. Um, when it's warmed up, we'll take it for a uh, short drive and uh, just uh, demonstrate the operation of the clutch and synchro mesh and drivability of the car, brakes and steering, etc. Okay. Anyway, starts right up, idles smoothly. Uh, what have we got for pressure here? Uh, so we've got around 60 psi of oil pressure when cold, and that's you know that's about what we expect uh, from the car. Um, handbrake is on. Um, we can also release the clutch now, and um, you know if the car needed a new release bearing, you'd hear the grinding, especially when it's cold or that bearing noise and there's no noise from that at all. And we now have this car idling at uh, around 850 RPM. And so let's go have a look at it. And uh, very nice, very nice even idle. This is quite exotic in the day. Twin cam engine and five speed uh, gearbox. Uh, and, uh, you know, when all the British cars, you know, were, were, you know, uh, push rod engines with, uh, with four speed gearboxes. So this, when you opened the hood in 1969, this was, a this was a racing engine. Um, okay. So let's uh, close it up. We'll warm it up and then we'll go for a drive. So I'm not sure about this acceleration, Excel um, lever, and you know what? It might not even be connected. Now that I think about it, it might be left over from the uh, from the uh, from the me or the mechanical injection system. And uh, it also occurs to me that the Webers might not even have chokes on them. So, so this I don't think does anything. Okay. Okay. So it's been idling for five or six minutes. Uh, our water temperature has uh, got off the peg, and uh, it is at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we have um, we have some heat coming in the car. The um, the uh, blower motor works. It's two speed, I think. Well, <laughs> there's two places for the switch. It's kind of <laughs> not that much difference between uh, low and high. But anyway, it's cold, so we're grateful for the um, grateful for the heat. Uh, our oil pressure is still up at um, uh, 55 pounds. Um, presumably, this car would have uh, 50 weight oil in it, but uh, I can check. No noise from the release bearing. So let's see. Oh, the gearbox is very nice. Crisp, positive. I could use a little bit more practice with it. Um, it feels like 
I think what do these engines have? Is the 1750cc? It's I believe they're around 110, 115 horsepower, and it, it feels like it. It's a lightweight car. I'll check the specs, but it you know must weigh under 2,500 pounds. Pulls from 15. The low speed tractability is excellent. Pulls from 1500 RPM. So now we're up to 160 uh, Fahrenheit on the water temperature and the oil pressure is settling at about uh, 40. Uh, it's a cold day. I mean, you'd expect the oil pressure to you know, go down to 20 PSI or so at idle. It, you know, there's no um, sort of resonance or rattling from, from the engine. You know, you know on, on some of these cars, uh, you know, there's sort of other noises that enter the cabin and sort of detract from the overall kind of experience as, as opposed to just the induction and the exhaust noise. On this car, I don't, I don't hear any of that. It's, um, you know, all you hear is, are the, like I said, the engine and the, uh, the exhaust. Um, you know, no, no noises from the ancillary components and, um, you know, no, uh, no, uh, you know, other resonances or vibrations or so on. It feels really tight. Like it feels, it feels like, well, a restored car should, should feel. Um, oftentimes when the cars are taken apart and substantial work is done to them, um, they don't actually drive that well. Uh, and, and or they need sort of significant sort of fettling, um, you know, just to, just to iron, out, iron out all those little problems. And this car, in, in terms of the powertrain, you know, uh, feels really, really quite sorted. Steering, brakes, gearbox. Synchro is beautiful. Braking. You know the roads. Road, the road isn't very good here, but you know it doesn't pull to one side or the other. Brakes are powerful. The uh, the pedals firm. And the gearbox. The gearbox is really nice. It takes a little while to get used to it, but I'll go down through the gears right now. So that's five, four, three, and we'll come to a stop here and I'll hit second. Uh, even first, the first gear of synchro seems okay, which is, which is, you know, notoriously weak for, I think, any car of this vintage. So I wouldn't normally downshift into first gear driving the car, but just to demonstrate it. Beautiful. So we've got good water temperature, and at idle here, we're settling to um, just about 1,000 RPM. Looks like it's around 20 PSI, which is what you'd expect. But let's go up through the gears now. That's at 60 miles an hour, and we will brake hard, okay? There's a big truck behind us, so not too hard. And uh, all is good, all is good. This car, this car drives really nicely. Um, Powertrain's excellent in it. Drivability is excellent. Brakes and steering are excellent. I'll just run it around some corners here too, because I didn't really try that. So let's just see what happens. So it handles nicely, flat, brakes nice, turns in well. Let's go in this parking lot here.
bit of gravel, so I need to be careful here. Oh yeah, it feels great. Tight. Turns in nice. Yeah, this is lots of fun. You know, feels flat. So that's, so the, the suspension that's in it's, the, you know, I would say designed for this kind of work, you know, a little bit more than dealing with rough um, and rough pavement. So, okay. So uh, that'll do it for the cold start and driving video. Um, this is a well-sorted car that uh, has an excellent powertrain. Uh, it doesn't smoke, um, starts instantly, settles down to uh, a nice idle quickly. Uh, the temperatures are, and pressures are all uh, behaving themselves where you'd expect them to be. Uh, braking, steering, uh, gearbox is excellent, uh, the, one of the best I've ever, ever, ever seen with uh, any vintage Alfa Romeo. Um, the, uh, some, something's been done to the suspension because I think the car is a little bit lower and a little bit stiffer uh, than stock and uh, over some bigger bumps. You know, you, you, you can feel the suspension bottoming, bottoming out, but uh, uh, on a flat surface, like a skid pad or whatever, you know, it, it uh, handles really nicely. Like, uh, so, I mean, it'd be, it'd be a great car for autocrossing, for like vintage autocrossing, and uh, yeah. So it's nicely behaved car that obviously has been um, gone through and uh, fully sorted.